Perfect. So welcome everybody. Thank you guys for tuning in to our uh, conservation conversations this Friday. Um, we're going to be doing them every Friday till the unforeseeable future. So today's going to be on marine debris, but we will be having future topics um, in the next couple of Fridays. Um, this presentation is going to be recorded and I will be sending it via email afterwards um, for anyone that wants to watch it or share it afterwards. So again, um, today's topic is on marine debris, challenges and solutions. Um, for those that might not know, my name is Cristo Espinosa. I work with Miami Eco Adventures, um, so I'm part of Miami-Dade County. And the Conservation Conversations is a partnership between Miami Eco Adventures, um, UF IFAS Extension, and Florida Sea Grant. Um, so Anna in the chat, as well as Heather, um, will be helping monitor the chat box because I can't see it. So if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to leave those there. Um, and they'll also be making sure everybody is on mute during the presentation. So again, a photo of myself. Um, I am an interpretive program leader and I am based out of Crandon Park. So before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and launch our poll. Um, so it's just five questions. Um, we'll be doing one before the presentation. I'll go ahead and pull this up afterwards as well. Um, you should be able to see it now. Uh, please make sure you scroll all the way to the bottom um, because the first five questions are not visible. Um, right at hand, you may see the first two. So just make sure you scroll all the way down and I'll give you guys a couple minutes to go ahead and fill that out, please. So we're waiting on a couple more. So if you guys about 15 more seconds, I think we're only missing one at this point. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and close it off. Um, and like I mentioned, we're gonna go ahead and um, redo this quiz towards the end of the presentation. Let me go ahead and close this. Okay, um, so a quick overview of what we're gonna be discussing today. Um, first of all, I'll be going over what exactly marine debris is, um, the different types of marine debris, some impacts that it has, um, some possible solutions, as well as how you can get involved. Um, so the photo I have on the right hand side, um, this is of a balloon um, that we found on one of our kayak programs. So this was a couple of days after Valentine's Day um, and we found two or three balloons entangled in mangroves. Um, so this is a pretty good example of some marine debris that we find here in South Florida um, that's impacting our coastal ecosystems like mangroves. So what is marine debris? Um, marine debris is anything man-made that is either intentionally or accidentally released into the ocean. They can range in size. They can be small microplastics, so small that you can't see with the naked eye, um, or some larger items like refrigerators. Um, and they may pose a threat to marine life and natural habitats. So you guys can see in the photo I included on the right, um, that was out at Crandon Park. You can see our rack line, um, which it, for the most part here is composed of sargasm seaweed. So that comes in um, during the tide and it's really good foraging ground for shorebirds. But you can see in the photo, there's a pretty large um, rope that's entangled in that rack line. 
So this is a good example of a larger marine, uh, piece of marine debris that we might find washed ashore. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and throw this uh, pretty staggering fact in. Um, there are an estimated 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic floating in the ocean. Um, so maybe if you're out for a walk near your waterways or out on the beach and um, it's relatively clean, that's awesome, but that's not to say um, that's how the rest of the world looks like. This is a worldwide issue, um, marine debris and seen in our waterways and our oceans. Um, and what's even crazier is that this fact is only relating to plastic that's floating. We also have larger pieces of marine debris like fishing nets um, and gear. And you know, that's a lot heavier and it'll sink down and affect our deeper waters. So that's not even accounted for in this fact. Um, so again, it's, it's pretty scary, the number. It's a lot of, a lot of debris. Um, so some different types of marine debris that are pretty common. We have microplastics, so that's any piece of plastic um, that's about the size of a bottle cap or smaller. So really tiny fragments, like I mentioned, some can keep breaking down and be microscopic. We also have bottle caps themselves, glass, styrofoam, food packaging, which is a big issue, just single use plastics in general. Um, and like I mentioned, fishing gear, and we also have ghost nets, which I'll go over in a little bit. So I wanted to include this picture so you guys can see how um, different types of marine debris may mimic natural items and can cause some confusion. So I labeled this as friend or foe. Um, the picture on the left, it's actually a piece of styrofoam. It has a bit of a yellow coloration. From the outside, it looks a little bit um, maybe like a washed up sea sponge. But you can see in the picture on the right, when I crack it in half, um, you can tell that it's styrofoam inside because it's completely solid throughout versus a natural sea sponge. If you open it, you'll see a lot of little holes. It might smell bad. There's probably some organisms in there. Um, so to the common beach goer or even an animal, it's very, uh, it can be sometimes hard to distinguish what's a natural sponge or what are these pieces of, of styrofoam that are mimicking a natural item. Um, so again, if that caused confusion for me, you can imagine for an animal that's maybe looking for a meal. Um, and these larger pieces of styrofoam and plastic in general will continue to break down into smaller and smaller pieces. So this is a relatively like large piece of styrofoam that's intact, um, but over time it could break down and become really small and it's hard when they're that small to be able to clean them out of the water. So where does all of this debris come from? So most of the debris comes from land pollution, about 80%. Um, I also mentioned beachgoers. Beachgoers would still be part of the land pollution, but because they're in such close proximity to the ocean, you know, leaving any uh, like trash on the beach, it becomes easier for wind and waves to kind of scoop them up and end up in the water. You also have fishermen and recreational boaters. Um, so those would be the sources of um, pollution on the water. So if they get any fishing gear or nets or lines or just kind of dump them in the water, um, that's causing marine debris. And then marine debris can come from either point or non-point sources. So really quickly, you guys can see in the photo um, that this is a lot of trash in a storm drain. So again, to show that even if you're inland, most of the pollution is coming from land and then travels via storm drain or wind or something else like that. So point versus non-point sources. So a point source directly shows a source that is depositing pollution into our oceans or our waterways. So you can see the photo on the right is of a storm drain. So it's something that's tangible. You can visibly see um, that is depositing some sort of polluted water um, into a waterway. So again, point source, you can visibly see what is adding something that's, you know, some source of pollution into our water. A non-point source, it's hard to trace where the pollution may have directly entered the ocean. Um, so for example, if you're out on the water and see a plastic bag or some sort of food wrapper, you know, you see it's in the water, so it's marine debris but you don't really know how it might have end up, uh, ended up there because it's not really showing you the path that it took um, or you're not seeing where it stems from. So that would be an example of non-point source. So this is a cool graphic from Ocean Conservancy and this would be um, a good example of a non-point source um, for a plastic bag. 
So you guys can see a plastic bag blows from a trash can, probably more inland, um, into a storm drain, travels through pipes and down river into the ocean where marine wildlife mistakes it for food. So again, you know, we see a lot of plastic bags in the water, but this would be an example of a non-point source kind of pathway that it took, um, even though it's not as easy for us to visually see that, that pathway throughout. Maybe you just see the end result of the plastic bag in the water. So some impacts um, that marine debris has, they can harm marine and terrestrial species, um, can cause damage to all the, a lot of different habitats. Um, there's a source of economic loss when it comes to things like tourism and fisheries because the more marine debris we have, for example, here in South Florida, a lot of people want to come and visit our pretty beaches. But if you have more marine debris, it's not as aesthetically pleasing. So that can cause a disrupt in our, um, our tourism industry. Uh, we also have bioaccumulation of chemicals and plastics that can cause harm to humans. Um, so by accumulation uh, is, you know, small little particles like the plastic that has some sort of chemical. And as you go up the food chain, uh, that those chemicals will begin to accumulate into each uh, consumer. And you guys could see in the video that I attached, um, I was out snorkeling and I thought there was a fish. So I decided to record and get a little closer to possibly ID it. But you can see even I got a little confused and it looks like it was some sort of balloon or plastic bag. So again, to show if I'm confused, imagine, you know, a sea turtle or some sort of other animal that doesn't really know any better and they're just looking for their next meal. So this is a cool graphic from NOAA. Um, this is focused more on how marine debris is harming wildlife. Um, so there's over 200 known species that are being impacted by marine debris. Um, those are both terrestrial and marine animals. So of course, we have our shorebirds that depend um, on water sources for food, so they're also being impacted. Um, the two main ways that they, uh, wildlife are being harmed by marine debris are through entanglement or ingestion. Um, so entanglement of these animals can um, limit their mobility to swim or to fly, um, and you know, can cut off their circulation if it's really tight. And then you have ingestion, so we can see on the right, the sea turtle eating a plastic bag, um, wildlife ingesting a lot of marine debris can be pretty fatal to the animal. Um, so this is a cool graphic from the Olive Ridley project. This one is focusing more on fishing gear and ghost nets, which I had mentioned a little earlier. Um, so really quick, you can see on the top that an estimated 6.4 million tons per year of fishing gear is discarded into our ocean. Um, so what ghost nets are is any fisherman that maybe has some lines or very large fishing nets um, goes ahead and directly puts it into our water, even though those nets aren't particularly being used by, you know, a human anymore, they're still being, uh, they're still causing a lot of damage, even though they're not being used. So on the top left, you can see, again, those fishing nets can be upwards of hundreds of feet long and they're pretty heavy. So on the top left, you can see that those large, um, now considered ghost nets, can completely smother out benthic habitats like uh, seagrass beds and coral reefs, which provide home and habitat um, and a food source to a lot of different organisms. And then you can see towards the middle that again, those large pieces um, of nets can Im impact a lot of nectin species. Um, so things like stingrays, sharks, whales, dolphins, turtles, um, they can, it could pretty much weigh them down and suffocate them. And of course, our animals that need to breathe air, like our turtles um, and our dolphins, you know, they'll be suffocating. They won't be able to, to reach the surface. So again, um, this is not, I guess, as common as marine debris that maybe you'll find on a beach cleanup uh, because this is taking place, you know, maybe in deeper waters or out in the water where we're not watching, but it is a pretty big issue. Um, this is a cool graphic on bioaccumulation. So as I mentioned, um, plastics will continue to break down into teeny, teeny, tiny little pieces, pretty much become microscopic. And so our smaller organisms like zooplankton in the number one portion, they'll be able to consume that. And those small plastics, um, you can see on the top, contain chemicals like DDT and PCBs. Um, and as we have primary consumers, secondary consumers, eventually us, as um, we continue to eat these, these animals, those chemicals can travel up the food chain and negatively, negatively affect 
not only wildlife, but also us. So again, that's a big impact um, on our fisheries as well. So some solutions, you know, it's, it's really scary um, to think about, but of course we have to think on the bright side and think of some ways uh, that we can help out. And so, for example, while beach cleanups are good, it's not the end all be all solution for marine debris. Um, when it comes to things like, like marine debris and pollution, um, we wanna be able to stop it at the source. So we can continuously do beach cleanups um, but you can see in the graphic, if we don't put, you know, some sort of plug to it, we're going to be cleaning the beach indefinitely um, versus stopping it at the source. You know, that's where most of that trash or pollution is coming from. So I included the picture on the bottom right. Um, there is a product called Storm X and you can see it's um, these mesh bags. They're very fine so they can trap smaller particles um, and they're put at the ends of storm drains and it helps collect debris from storm water runoff. So this is a, a cool, you know, invention that that's out on the market now. Um, I'm not sure how effective or practical it is to be able to clean out those mesh bags and how often that is. But again, it strides towards um, stopping it from entering other waterways and eventually um, our oceans. Um, I also want to mention a good solution is just reducing our reliance on single use plastics. Um, I included this uh, fact that items like plastic bags are used for an estimated 12 minutes. So if you're at the grocery store and not for a plastic bag, the lifespan of you using it, you know, just from the store to your car into your house and then that's it, is about 12 minutes um, versus, you know, the numerous years it takes to even attempt to, to break down and disintegrate. Um, so again, on the right hand side, you can see, maybe you remember our three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. I'm here to tell you there's a couple other and some of them should be a little bit higher up your list. So you can see in this picture that step one and two is rethink and refuse. So again, while re things like recycling are good and reusing things, um, we should kind of shift gears and focus a bit more on refusing. So, you know, refusing food packaging or cutlery Instead of, you know, you going to the store and getting the plastic bag and thinking, how, I feel so bad for taking it. How do I reuse this? Is it recyclable? So just refusing at the source means that you don't have to think about it anymore. And you prevent that one less thing from ending up in the landfill. Um, recycling can be helpful, but again, it's not as effective. Um, for one, not everything's recyclable. So even though a lot of people have the best intentions in mind, um, it's very easy for people to think, you know, our pizza boxes are recyclable, but they're not if there's a lot of grease inside of it. So that also can cause contamination. Um, most pieces of plastic can only be recycled two to three times. And so their lifespan by being recycled is not that long. Um, and it's also based on a market supply and demand. So if there's no demand for, recycling, uh, for recyclables, it's not really going to be efficient. So again, your six R's, think about refusing things. Um, kind of gross, but I thought this was also interesting. So there was a study in 2015 that showed that mealworms can actually eat styrofoam and make it part of their diet. Um, so again, while, you know, hopefully in the future, we're aiming towards using less single use plastics, there's still a lot of it that's out, you know, in the water that's already there and it's not really breaking down or it's breaking down into small pieces and not really disintegrating. So it's cool to see that there's different organisms that can eat it. Um, also, there was a study in 2016 that showed, uh, it found bacteria using enzyme to eat plastic. So again, these are cool studies to show maybe the future of cleaning up all that mass amount of marine debris, you know, is with these animals. So again, really cool studies of seeing what we can do in the future. Um, so here are some ways that you directly can get involved. So again, refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, minimize your use of single-use plastics. Uh, beach cleanups, again, while it's not the end-all be-all, it's also, you know, it's still good. Um, so I also wanted to mention that in the future, you can join us for our Eco Action Days. Um, specifically for Cranon, those are usually um, every Saturday of the month. Um, so hopefully you could join us in the future. I also want to stress that cleaning up your yard and your neighborhood when you're out on walks can minimize the amount of trash that makes its way to the ocean. Um, so don't feel bad if you're not near the water because, again, 80% of, of the trash is coming from land. 
So if you see a food wrapper in your, um, in your yard, just by picking that up, you're preventing that little food wrapper from being picked up by the wind and going down a storm drain. So it's, it's helpful. And also voting on ocean issues and contacting your government representatives are all really good ways to help combat marine debris. So I wanted to include this little graph again. So the top is the most preferable, is just refusing. What waste can you avoid completely? Um, then you go into reduce. What, you know, what can I use less of? Reusing things so you don't just get rid of it after one use. Um, recycling, again, is helpful, but there's a little bit more steps um, that might be a bit more efficient. Um, and then I also didn't mention, you can see on the bottom, it says rot. So composting is a good way um, to minimize the amount of food scraps that are ending up in our landfills. Um, so this is another cool graphic on tips of how to use less plastic. Um, so it's a bit overwhelming, you know, it's maybe you want to like, you feel bad and you want to change completely and do a 180 on everything you use. Um, but this is a cool graphic to show you like little ways that you could be a bit more eco-friendly and use a little bit less single use plastics, which again is a majority of things that are, are a bouncing to marine debris. So I have a few of my own to kind of go ahead and show you. So I have my own reusable water bottle. It's insulated, um, carries a lot more water than a plastic water bottle. So, you know, this is going to have a longer shelf life than just using plastic, which I like. Um, I also have a plethora of different straws, probably more than I need. Um, but, you know, there's stainless steel. These are for smoothies, so they're really big. I have bamboo straws, normal stainless steel straws. Also things like reusable bags. So I have this one. This one's actually made out of um, plastic bottles. So opting for canvas bags or reusable bags instead of plastic bags, you know, these are really sturdy and they last a long time. Um, a bit more on the otter side, I have a compostable phone case. So there's a lot of cool products that are out um, and help make the change to using less um, plastic easier, which is pretty cool. Um, a little bit more of a focus into what we're doing at Crandon. Um, so we piloted a program a couple months ago. Um, we titled it Marine Debris Citizen Science Program. So alongside our Eco Action Days, we wanted to focus on larger groups that come out, clean the beach with us. And you can see on the right hand side, after we clean the beach, we put all the trash out onto a tarp. Um, and this program allows for these groups to act like citizen science, uh, scientists and help us um, sort out the trash by different types of marine debris, help tally it up so they're helping to quantify data. Um, and hopefully these results that we're getting can be used towards implementing bans of different items um, in different parks. So for example, with Miami-Dade parks, styrofoam and glass are prohibited in parks. And so, you know, trying to run this program helps get people involved, helps keep our beaches clean, and hopefully gives us an idea of what we're finding on our shorelines here um, in local areas to see what we're finding the most of and maybe use that for future bands. Um, this is a cool graphic I made of just kind of summarizing how the last couple months of this program have been going. So uh, within a four month span, we've had 100 volunteers help out, close to 50 pounds of trash removed, and over 3,400 total pieces of marine debris removed off the beach, which is pretty awesome. Um, you can see it kind of sorted out by month, but the five main culprits, if you will, of like what we're finding is microplastics, styrofoam, plastic bags, bottle caps, and straws. Um, so again, we're hoping to continue this project in the future. So if you have any large groups in mind, I did include the email of our resiliency coordinator down below. Um, and we hope to have some groups in the near future um, help out with this because it's a really cool study that we have going on. So that's kind of wrapping up our presentation. I'm going to go ahead and open up that poll again. So if you guys could please um, go ahead and take the poll. Remember, there's five questions. So if you can please um, scroll all the way to the bottom before you, head and go, before you go ahead and submit your answers. Um, and I'll give you guys just a, a minute or two to fill that out.
And while everyone's wrapping up their polls, if there's any questions that you have for Crystal, please feel free to go ahead and uh, type them in the chat box. We did have a few comments. Um, Barbara mentioned we would need billions of mealworms when you were discussing the mealworm study, Crystal, to, to break down all of that, the styrofoam. We need billions of them for that to happen. I'm sure. And, <laughs> and then Valentina made a comment, we need enforcement education campaigns, uh, conscious awareness, laws protecting the ocean, people with good manners, etc. Agreed. So I'm going to go ahead and share the results really quickly. So what happens to plastic trash in the ocean, everyone got it, breaks down into smaller pieces. Um, what are the two main ways that marine debris can harm wildlife? It was ingestion and entanglement. Um, it is easy for microplastics to be removed from the ocean. That's false. It's pretty hard, especially when some of them you can't even see. Land pollution accounts for what percentage of marine debris is 80%. Um, the only way to minimize the amount of marine debris is to conduct beach cleanups. That's false. We went over a ton of different ways that you guys can help out. Okay. Barbara said you did an outstanding job, Crystal. Thank you. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, we're going to be putting a final valuation in the chat box. I will also be sending you guys an email with the final valuation as well as the recording of this video. Um, I also put both of our um, social media handles. So if this, is, if this webinar was interesting, hopefully it was. Um, and you guys want to see some future topics, we'll be posting um, weekly on what's coming up. And I also included my email down below if you guys have any questions or any comments regarding the presentation or anything regarding marine debris. Um, but I hope you guys liked it. Thank you so much, Crystal. Wonderful job. We want to thank you guys all for joining us please we're still open to fielding questions and i did want to mention that every week we'll be announcing the topics for the friday webinars we'll be announcing it either on monday or tuesday on our respective social media channels but if there are any of you who would prefer to receive an email or would like to have an email i'm certainly happy to keep a list just with that just to email you to give you the heads up for the webinars and that your email would not be used for anything else. And just so you know, the links that you use to register for today will now be the same from here on out. So anyone who signs up for the 1 p.m. webinar will use the same link. If you all decide to join us at the 5 p.m. webinar, you'll have the same link to register. So that won't change anymore. You'll just have to, when you register, you should have been asked to choose a date. So that link should remain the same, but we're happy to email you reminders every week with the topics. All right, Barbara, I've got you noted. And there was a question from Valentina and I'm gonna, I'm gonna send this over to my eco colleagues. What is the parks department? And I'm assuming she means Miami-Dade County Parks doing to prevent trash in the ocean? So like I mentioned, we do host the Eco Action Days um, in our partnering parks, um, which it's about five or six of us in the nature centers. Um, we do the beach cleanups at Crandon, but we also have some parks that are inland or near waterways. Um, so we also help clean up those. Um, I mentioned in our 1 p.m. Um, webinar because someone had a question regarding waterways. Um, in the past, we've also hold, hosted a program um, called Critical Splash. Um, there's some other entities in um, Miami-Dade County that have hosted, at, hosted that like Pelican Harbor. Um, and that's more of a cleanup on our waterways and non-motorized vehicles like canoes, paddle boards, kayaks. Um, so we have hosted those in the past um, in areas like Matheson near the marinas and waterways. And there's also an effort to ensure there's enough trash cans for use within our parks. We also have a volunteer program, a, volu a, a volunteer program within the Parks Department, Miami-Dade County Parks called PLACE. Um, and we have a program within PLACE uh, called the, the 
PCC, the Parks Conservation Corps. And basically that's a specialized, highly trained group of volunteers that we have that go out and do special projects within our parks and legacy projects. So if you're interested in being more involved with parks on a wide variety of volunteer projects, Valentina, I suggest uh, you check out the PLACE program as well. And I think one, one other thing to mention that Crystal highlighted is that there have been uh, pieces of small legislation that do limit the use of certain products, like there are no styrofoam products allowed in any Miami-Dade County parks. So I think that's likely going to be a more strong way, going back to the idea of source reduction, is that hopefully if these items aren't entering the parks, they'll be less likely to enter the waterways and less likely to end up on the coast. So I think that's a good first step that Miami-Dade County and I want to say City of Miami have employed to a certain degree in a lot of their public spaces. Are there any final questions? All righty. Crystal, you want to yeah. take away? So again, thank you guys for joining. Um, as I mentioned, I will be emailing you guys the recording of this um, so you can go ahead and share it with friends or we rewatch it. Um, I will also be sending out the final valuation. Um, it should be in the chat box, but again, I'll email it to you guys and we ask that you please fill that out. Um, and again, if this is something that you guys were interested in, please you know, look in the future for the, the upcoming topics that we'll be having on these um, conservation conversations on Fridays. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye, have a nice weekend.